mentioned a little bit that Jackie Warlarski uh, in Ways and Means, they were marking up the, the, the tax side of the bill uh, when we were doing um, the energy and commerce policy side of the bill, strip, stripping out um, uh, the ACA. And uh, there were a lot of gains that uh, went on in the beginning. Uh, they kept uh, talking, you know, they would, everybody would get five minutes, so they kept the dialogue going before we took up any of the amendments. They didn't tell us how many amendments they had. They, then we finally found out there was about 100. They hadn't put all the amendments forward. Then there was that game on the floor yesterday where they um, were going to adjourn, uh, adjourn the House, so we would all have to go back and we would have to uh, vote not to adjourn, so that would slow the whole process down. And it took us literally 12 hours before we finished the First Amendment. And the First Amendment, when we got to it finally, was um, three hours of discussion on the First Amendment. And you know what the First Amendment was? Changing the name of the bill. <laughs> three hours about changing the name of the bill. Just some snotty name. Uh, yeah, so it was something like um, the Republican Not Affordable Health Care Act or something like that. Yeah, you pay more and get less. I mean, something ridiculous like that. Uh, but I would say that after um, we sort of got a lot of the, um, uh, you know, the, the contention out of the way, we uh, really got down to some very good policy discussion. And I had a chance to really witness how both sides really worked together on that uh, committee. And they really go back and forth, and they are very respectful of each other. Uh, they're, um, I thought Chairman Walden did a great job um, making sure that we were very um, respectful and, and kept, kept the um, conversations moving and, and stuck to the time because we knew we had a very uh, long night ahead of us. And uh, what finally ended up happening is I think we got a, a, through about 10 amendments. I mean, we didn't really do a lot. And I think um, they came to an agreement. I think the chairman and the ranking member uh, came to an agreement that we have to the floor and we had some other votes. And when Ways and Means passed their bill out at 4.30 in the morning, they got to go home. And now what the next step is, we passed the bill to move it to budget. So next week, uh, both the Ways and Means bill and our um, bill will go to budget and they will then pass it out of budget and send it to the floor the following week. We should be able to pass it off of our floor and then send it over to the Senate. The goal is to get that uh, bill on the President's desk uh, before we leave on um, for spring break in April and then have it done. I mean, we are working really, really hard to make sure that gets done because we have a very small window of opportunity to get the repeal and the replace, the first phase of it, completely done. The second phase of repeal replace um, is with uh, Tom Price, and Tom Price being the Secretary of HHS. Secretary <coughs> of HHS has a tremendous amount of power from an administrative point of view when it came to the ACA. There was something like 1,400 provisions in the ACA uh, that said that the Secretary of HHS shall or may do X, Y, and Z. So Tom is now in the process of going through what exactly he can do to unwind some of the ACA from an administrative point of view. Then the third phase uh, is um, we will have to go through regular order on issues like um, having insurance companies compete over state lines. That will go through regular order. It will take 60 votes out of the Senate. And the President has agreed to campaign in those states where senators who are up for re-election on the Democrat side in states he won, because we need eight of those senators. So he is totally engaged. He's very engaged on uh, the policy that we uh, have passed out that will go to the floor, that will go to budget and into the floor. He's, he's on board, uh, and so it's very exciting. And I have to say that um, even though I was there for 27 hours and 27 minutes, um, I, I, I feel like I'm a part of history. I mean, this, this vote, um, these votes that were taken today, and this vote to pass this bill out of our committee is one of the major entitlement reforms that I think we've had since like 1965 or maybe even in the, in the history of this country. So it's a big, big deal. Now, we're all getting beat up from it from the other side, but that's okay. We can handle it.
And real quickly, I'll tell a little bit about my, my work flex bill, and, and then I'll, I'll, I'll turn it back to you, Sarah. Uh, Sarah. But we are about to um, put forward a bill, and it's not completely finished. The language isn't completely done, so we haven't dropped it yet. But basically, what it says is it gives um, businesses an incentive to um, work with with their employees and give them more uh, work flex flexible work hours. And what will happen is we're seeing a lot of states right now, like in the state of California, they're starting to mandate paid leave. Okay, and uh, what we want to do is we don't want businesses to have to, we don't want to have to mandate businesses to do that, but we want businesses to have the opportunity. If they have businesses in a state where there's mandatory paid leave, they could opt in to um, uh, our program, our federal program, where if they, we would, they would work out some sort of flexible work schedule and maybe they do offer um, paid leave, uh, but it wouldn't be mandated and it would allow businesses to be uniform across the country. So for example, if they had business in California and California had mandatory paid leave, they had a business in Arizona and they had mandatory paid leave, then this would supersede that and it would give them uniformity throughout um, uh, with their businesses throughout the country. So we're still working on the details. It's a very exciting bill. Um, I think we're going to get a lot of support for it. We've been talking to the Speaker's office. We've been talking to the White House about it. So very excited. Um, and when we're ready to drop the bill, you're going to know about it. So with that, thanks. So I promised Mimi she would go first. But now I want to go back and welcome all of you. Um, the Women and Women Tour started two and a half years ago. We do it around the country. Um, all the women uh, up here have done it with me, and, and Susan has done it as well, and then uh, Renee Walters. Um, did it as well with us and what we do is we travel the country we talk to women and as we all know all issues are women's issues and we come back and introduce legislation hence the uh, women and women's agenda that's on your chair the other thing we started doing which is really fascinating for me because Republican Main Street Partnership has 73 members of Congress a lot of us live in this a lot of them live in the swing districts I'm also focus grouping so I'm going around talking to women who voted for Obama, who now voted for Trump, and asking them why, and gathering the information from them as to why they voted Republican. Do they think they'll be uh, voting Republican in the mid-years? So it's really fascinating. What are their key issues that they want uh, the Main Street members and the members of Congress to be working on? So that's fascinating. Our next one is uh, April 19th, we're going to Las Vegas. We're going to focus group them. Um, obviously, Nevada. We did not do well in Nevada. We lost uh, the Senate seat. We lost two House seats over that. So we're going to talk to the women as to how they voted, why they voted that way, and the issues that we can try to be pushing here at, uh, in Washington to, to answer their needs. So that's kind of what the Women of Women is doing. We also have a PAC um, and a super PAC that was started. And our goal is to help uh, Congresswoman Stefanik find women across the country. She's finding everybody, but our goal is to find women and help fund them because uh, there's obviously an issue with funding women and getting them up through the process quickly. Um, so our PAC uh, just started. We're doing grassroots across the country, you know, collecting those $5 type of contributions for women um, as well as PACs here. And then I had some uh, men ask me if they could contribute to the Wonder Woman. I'm like, of course. Um, no right, like no problem. <laughs> so we have that going as well. It's just kind of a new piece to make sure that the women of Main Street all up here are protected and then hopefully we can get some additional women. So I want to thank you all for coming. Uh, but maybe you got energy to keep going? Yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I'm all in. You I, are. You're good. good. <laughs> so next I'll turn it over to uh, Ileana and she can talk about the issues that she's working on, especially in, in the foreign relations area. Well, thank you very much. I'll take back my, my microphone. Um, thank you so much, Sarah. Thank you for existing. Thank you for having this great organization. Let's give a raise. So, so thankful for the uh, positive, upbeat uh, agenda that we have, uh, the legislations that, uh, that all of us are involved with, and uh, we thank you for what you're doing to help us politically and legislatively and thank you to all of you all of you who are, who are part of this uh, main street coalition because we really are the majority we really are the folks who are not so much on this side and not so much on the other side but we're somewhere in the middle depending on the issue 
and uh, so we thank you. And you're the kind of voter that I desperately need. I have a district where Hillary Clinton won with uh, 25 points. Uh, so that is a humdinger of a district. Marco Rubio even lost in my district, and he's our hometown boy. So this group really appeals to to my heart and to my brain because you're where I want. Uh, you're where I want to be. And uh, as Sarah had pointed out, the the issues that I'm involved with are kind of foreign issue to you, but they're domestic issues to my district because I have a majority minority district, uh, uh, minority majority, however it is you say that. Most of the folks in my district were born somewhere else, like I was. I was born in Cuba, came over to the United States when I was eight. I'm gonna be 65 uh, this year, and we've been waiting and, and working for that day for Cuba to be free, still waiting and still working. But most of the folks in my district were born in Cuba or Venezuela or Nicaragua, uh, Colombia. So for us, uh, or Israel, uh, foreign affairs are really daily uh, domestic affairs. And so the way I look at Congress is so different. I know because I know members of Congress the way that they look at it. And uh, what is a big deal here in Congress may not be as important to my district. So there's a little bit of a disconnect, but that's okay. I'm starting my, I'm in my 27th year up here, so I've gotten used to the fact that this is like two different worlds. But, uh, but I love this job. It really is amazing. And when you think about the possibilities of this great country, I came here, as I told you, when I was eight, and I didn't know a word of English. I mean, literally, not a word. My parents, less than a word, negative 10. And, uh, and now I'm a member of Congress, and it tells you about the possibilities and, and the challenges of the opportunities that we have in this great country. So in my community, we, you know, we hear people talking bad things about the United States, but in my district, we don't get that. We understand the greatness and the exceptional nature of this great country. Whether they're you know, on the right or on the left, there's a great understanding that uh, uh, that in our native countries things aren't so great. Whether it's in Cuba, where women are beaten up every Sunday as they silently walk to mass, las damas de blanco, the ladies in white, they dress in white, they have a flower in their hand, they walk to church with a with a photo of their loved one who is in jail, was in jail, or or maybe uh, is was out of was out of jail, but they had been mistreated. And for that, the state police come and they beat them up. This Sunday, they stoned them. They threw stones at them. I mean, buckets of stone, stones at. And it's just amazing the, the the deprivations that women go through in so many countries. And and we complain here about how rough it is for a woman. And I think it, that it's important to, to complain and improve conditions. But when when I in my foreign affairs post. When I think about women in Saudi Arabia, when I think about women in Syria, uh, when I think about women in so many countries that are, are just uh, uh, in dire straits, that are sold as commodities, they're 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 less than than a dog, less certainly less than a horse because that would be valuable to that uh, landowner. It's just terrible, and uh, it doesn't mean that we shouldn't improve conditions here. But I always have the mindset, oh my goodness, um, the things that we complain about and, and what we take for granted. And the first world problem, that's right, Martha. And uh, so I, I give thanks to God every day that I'm in this incredible job, that I have the luxury of, of speaking my mind freely and nobody's tossing you in jail. That's not everywhere for women in the world. And, and the more you read, and that's why I encourage, when I go to schools, encourage kids to read, 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 read about what's going on in the world, and it opens their eyes about, oh my goodness, is that really true? This is what women go through in this country and in that country. So, so that's my perspective on, uh, on the state of, of women around the world, which is pretty sad. Now, domestically, um, I've been involved in the, uh, in the fight against eating disorders. I am very involved with a, uh, some groups down in my district and uh, that's a big issue for them. And, and uh, in, in the big bill that, thanks to Tim Murphy and others and Fred Upton, we were able to pass 
a lot of a lot of good good bills in that big bill. Uh, we passed the the Anna Weston Act, which is a, a an act dealing with uh, uh, eating disorders and uh, and encouraging uh, more more providers to cover this. You know, it's very expensive, just like drug rehab. Eating disorder uh, treatment is very expensive, out of reach of most most parents and most families, and uh, it's uh, it's more prevalent than, than you would think. So domestically, I've been involved uh, with that issue and uh, and helping all of, all of my my women colleagues with their issues as well. So for me, every day is a great day because I live in the greatest country. Thank God for that. Which I had asked you. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you. The other issue. The other issue we find uh, when we travel and talk to the women, I just found this in Ohio, none of them unfortunately have ever even heard of 21st Century Cares. They had no idea what it was, and I'm like, this could really affect your life and maybe save your life or a loved one's life. That's the problem with the media. I mean, it's just not getting out there. So that's one good thing about the Women to Women Tour. And in Las Vegas, uh, Mimi's doing that. We've already had 200 RSVPs, so it's a little bit bigger than we normally like to do, but you know, as we go back and people find out we're doing this and answering their questions, uh, they're, they're coming like crazy now. So well, on that note, we want to introduce uh, Elise who will talk about educating the women in this country and some of the things she has around the Pell Grants and other great pieces of legislation. Great. Um, thank you, Sarah, and thank you to the Women to Women Tour. I've had the opportunity to participate in a few events, uh, one with Susan Brooks in Indianapolis, another one in upstate New York, in Corning, New York. And what I find uh, at these uh, events is it's great to hear the questions from uh, the women in the audience on all sorts of issues. But even as someone who's sitting there on the panel, I'm always in awe of hearing about all the different initiatives that my colleagues are working for, local community. Uh, I find that women are, uh, are, are strong partners with one another. So my committees, I'm on the Education and Workforce Committee, and uh, the bill that Sarah was referencing is my year-round flexible Pell Grant bill. Uh, this would allow students to apply for Pell Grant funding, not just in the traditional fall and spring semesters, but over the course of the summer as well. And the reason why I think that's important is as we seek to modernize our education and, incur and uh, ensure that it's accessible and affordable, that will allow students, especially non-traditional students, to graduate faster and take out less uh, smaller amounts of loans if they're able to graduate within a shorter period versus the traditional uh, fall and spring semester. This was an idea that came to me from a, um, a president of a community college in my district who is a woman, and uh, we've had very positive feedback. And to underscore the point of uh, the support we received from our colleagues, I gave a one minute on the House floor today, and uh, Ileana was sitting next to me, and as I was walking out, she said, Sign me up. I want to get on that <laughs> bill. <laughs> she was the only member that did that, but I think it, it proves the point that women are strong partners with one another. And um, again, I learn, I learn new things every day about uh, the women I'm serving with. Another important initiative, I think, in the Education and Workforce Committee that is uh, not being highlighted, but it's an important part of the healthcare discussion, is the employer-sponsored healthcare aspect. And yesterday, we did not have quite as long of a markup as we <laughs> would be. Ours was only a couple, only two hours. Uh, but we passed three really important bills out of the Education and Workforce Committee that will have an impact on our healthcare system. One is we're continuing to strengthen wellness programs. Uh, employers, certainly in my district and across the country, are putting into place really innovative wellness programs to help to lower health care costs and encourage employees to make positive health care decisions. That shouldn't be partisan. It got out by a, a party line vote. So the fact that you had Democrats speaking against wellness programs, it means we are winning the discussion. Uh, the second bill that we passed was allowing small businesses to pool together to purchase health care to increase their purchasing power to get better options of the associated health care plans. Again, that's a common sense proposal. It shouldn't have passed by party line vote, but now the Democrats uh, are on record voting against that. And the third was strengthening businesses who choose to self-insure, uh, which many businesses are choosing that direction. Um, I think uh, health care, when we discuss it broadly, because we're on the limit to limit tour, it's important to remember that the vast majority of health care decisions whether it's for their family members, their kids, their spouses, or their elderly parents, 87% of those decisions are made by women. 
so health care costs, the lack of choices from your providers, this is having an impact on women, and we are proposing a better direction and a better way and more options and flexibility so that people can make good decisions about health care plans that work for them and they're affordable and more accessible. So I'm very excited about the direction we're moving, and um, I am very excited to be here today. And last, but the one thing I have found about the men of Main Street, they all want the women of Main Street to come and do an event in their districts. <laughs> Y'all know David Young? He's like, could, could you come? So I'll be talking Iowa. to you guys about that one. I was like, okay. So the men are getting it, though. A couple years ago we, when we started this, um, they looked at me like, uh, okay. And now? They're like, oh, this is a great idea. When can you come to our district? So it's kind of funny to see even the men evolve. Um, but on that note, we're thrilled to uh, have uh, Martha here with us. And she is going to talk about small business, tax, and rent reform, and women in health, or anything you'd like to do. Yeah, exactly. Uh, thanks, Sarah. This is great. I uh, appreciate all your work. And Ella, you're awesome. You know, even on a, on a rough day here, I'm on my second term, you know, I got to come visit, visit with you. But, um, just uh, inspirational, really, and, and thanks everybody for, for coming. And what Main Street is exactly, if you look at the bell curve of the country, you know, the vast majority of us are, you know, right there as opposed to the, the extremes, although that's often what the, you know, discussions are, uh, unfortunately. So, um, I was 26 years in the military uh, before I embarked on this new, uh, combat zone that I deployed to. <laughs> uh, and I, I was an attack pilot. I was in the first group of women to become fighter pilots and flew uh, in combat and commanded in combat. Um, and I can I consider my time here a uh, continuation really of that service as a little um, important note. When I raised my right hand and took the oath of office um, two years ago for the first time, it's the same exact oath of office I took as a military officer, same exact wording. So I do consider this a continuation of my service in civilian clothes. Um, I feel that um, part of my, you know, I hate when, when we make stereotypes about women. I've been fighting them my whole life. Uh, so part of my um, role in life and my purpose on this planet is to create cognitive dissonance in people for the stereotypes they have. And for a long time it was woman warrior, where people just couldn't handle those two being in the same place. And now it's feminist Republican. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I just try and, I try and really, you know, break, break through the stereotypes. So, um, I'm the only female veteran in the GOP on the House side. Of, uh, used to be 241, 41, but with our uh, appointees to the administration, I think we're down to 237. Uh, we have so few veterans out there anyway, and on the Republican side, it's uh, Joni Gorenz in the Senate and, and me in the House. And so I think there's a unique voice that we have. My wheelhouse, my background is in security, uh, so I'm on the Armed Services Committee and I'm on the Homeland Security Committee. So, I mean, what the strength that I bring to this place is related to security issues. Uh, just as an example of the kind of day I had, I was on uh, MSNBC with Andrea Mitchell talking about the Marine Corps uh, scandal uh, related to the uh, atrocities oh, yeah, the yeah, photos yeah. and the I had a meeting with the Commandant yesterday and it's great that he sought me out to speak with me in the role that I'm in. Uh, uh, to uh, you know, talk about uh, what they're going to what they're going to be doing on these issues, and really holding them accountable and kicking their ass as needed, related to holding people accountable, but also addressing the underlying cultural issues. And so I have that unique role that I can speak with authority based on my background on some of these issues. Uh, but then, just before this, I came from an interview with the Washington Times related to talking about border security on the border security. Uh, subcommittee chair on uh, the Homeland Security Committee, and so I've got that responsibility of the 2,000 miles southern border and the maritime border and visa security. So, you know, speaking to them about some of the dynamics we're seeing with these transnational criminal organizations, these cartels, look, look, every woman in our country wants to make sure that they and their family are safe and secure. So, when it comes to uh, military readiness, when it comes to Homeland Security, uh, it's just extremely important, important that we have people and women. Uh, that have expertise, and it also breaks the stereotypes. It's not like you know, women aren't just not relegated to talk about you know education and healthcare and the soft issues. Like, no, I want to talk about kicking ISIS's ass. Like, so let's <laughs> like let's you know let's have people that can be at the table to address these you know typically hard issues, these security issues, so we can be a strong voice. At least is on armed services and uh, Ileana much a, a part of my focus but also I saw uh, over the last couple years that I was here I was extremely frustrated on the issue related to equal pay and what I was seeing going on and like many issues we often see what happens is the 
Democrats sort of, uh, you know, grab the narrative and they come up with solutions that are not necessarily good for women and they're maybe bad for small businesses, like um, the Paycheck Fairness Act, as an example. Uh, and it's good for trial lawyers, right? So, so they're out there talking about the issue. And what happens is, you know, Republicans, and I'm stereotyping, we, ta we take out charts and graphs and we talk about how it's, there's not really an issue, right? And we lose every time we approach an issue that way. The, there's a, the real facts are that women still feel extremely frustrated about opportunities, and there's a variety of different reasons why we have a pay gap. It often gets mischaracterized by the left, quite frankly, but when we don't talk about it, then we just cede the issue uh, to them. And so I felt frustrated by this. I was the only Republican on the floor last year on Equal Pay Day getting up talking about equal pay. I'm for equal pay. Aren't you for equal pay? Like, why are we not for equal pay? Uh, so I started really looking into this issue as somebody who's dealt with, um, you know, discrimination myself in my path in the military and the, the biases that we can have. And, uh, you know, started to study up on the issue. And the realities are, if you look at all jobs uh, that are full-time year-round in all jobs, not side-by-side, -side, same job, then, you know, the different ways that it's being measured, but it's about 81 cents on the dollar, all jobs year round. So not, you know, you're the engineer with 10 years of experience, you're the engineer with 10 years of experience. That's not the, you know, pay gap that the Democrats keep saying it is. And so when I took a deep dive taking a look at like, well, what's really driving this? Uh, again, complex issues, uh, but there are underlying factors that are impacting why, you know, women are entering uh, lower paying career fields, why they're not getting into the you know, science, technology, financial sector, those types of things that are putting them on different paths. Then there's a reality of when women are trying to have a family, they're still primarily responsible for children. Ideally, we could get to a place where fathers are just as responsible as mothers. But you know, women are often then seeking flexibility or moving in and out of the workforce, and that's impacting uh, their ability, and they get further behind. And so uh, those are just a, some of the factors that are really the root cause. When you, when you really look at it, that some of these other issues get you from 81 to about 95 cents. Uh, and these, oftentimes, again, Republicans say, well, these are women's choices. Well, if it's your choice as a single mom that you're trying to, like, you know, take care of your kid while you're trying to make ends meet, then we shouldn't use words like that. Like, this is the situation that that woman has been put in. Let's figure out how to remove barriers, and it doesn't necessarily need more legislation, but maybe we, but we need to talk about it. Let's, like, not pretend there's no problem. Because there is a problem, right? But if we can address, you know, the 95 cents to a dollar is unexplainable, and a lot of that is just flat-up discrimination. But if we can actually do some things to raise awareness and address the issue that moves the needle from 81 to 95, now we're winning, right? So because of, you know, just my personal frustration about how we were seeding this space, uh, I launched an effort, a GOP working group on women in the 21st century workforce. Uh, our intent is to get into the space, just like Paul Ryan was doing on the poverty issue uh, previously, feeling like, why are the Democrats owning this? Like, we need to get into the space and come up with our solutions and be talking about it and acknowledging the challenges. So we kicked this off last year. Uh, there's men and women uh, on the on the uh, team. We had a couple. We had one hearing in D.C. I had a field hearing in my district, and we're kicking it off again. Uh, with additional hearings uh, starting in March. Uh, we intend to be working with Ivanka Trump, who's talking about these issues, the administration. I think there's really an opportunity for us to address some of these issues in a way that isn't hurting small businesses, but is also acknowledging that we still have a problem. Uh, and again, in some cases, just raising awareness to get uh, employer awareness and to identify best practices and solutions and addressing these issues is going to be helpful for women. So that's really been another focus of mine because uh, I just feel like we shouldn't be seeding the space and we need to be talking about it and come up with good solutions. Okay. Thank you. So we have a few questions from the audience. Nancy, do you want to go first? I'd be happy to. First of all, thank you, Sarah, for not only having the idea to launch Women to Women, but then having the incredible energy and enthusiasm to, to launch it. And, and really, it's been fun to watch it grow over the last couple years, and I think it's got great growth potential beyond. Um, listening to the four of you uh, as members, it, it's amazing, right? It's a good reminder, I think, for all of us of the incredible um, depth of knowledge and enthusiasm and strategic ability that we have in the women in Congress. How do we help you attract more women like you to Congress? So that, because I agree with what you said, Elise, that I think women do support women well. And I think early in my career, that probably was not the case. I think that has developed over time, that people, women are much more supportive of women. So how do we help you expand your network? 
we need Could more women candidates. Um, you know, this has been a priority for all of us is uh, reaching out to women candidates. But now sitting as chair of recruitment, Mimi Walters is vice chair of the NRCC, or deputy chair of the NRCC as a whole. Um, in terms of the candidates that reach out, we need to do better at ensuring that we're developing a pipeline of non-traditional candidates. Um, and that means more women, it means more metrics, it means lots of candidates coming from different backgrounds, it means more African-American, Hispanic candidates. Uh, what we're doing as a recruitment committee at the NRCC is we have a cross-section of the conference, so you have an ideological diversity, uh, public study committee members, Tuesday group members, Freedom Caucus members and others who kind of represent the different districts from the significantly Republican districts to the more swing districts to the opportunities to go on offense. Uh, what we try to do for potential women candidates is assign them to a, a woman member who maybe has a similar background or has uh, similar choices to make. So for example, they have young children or maybe their children have graduated. You can put them in touch with different candidates here. The other thing is, you know, from the perspective of organizations, the NRCC doesn't engage in open seat primaries, but to make a difference, both Martin and I had primaries, and I think it's important that women have strong campaign teams to get out of the primaries, because if you can't get women out of the primaries, they're not going to general election, and I think that's a priority for, for many people like Sarah and others who want to engage in this process. Well, and also 90% of the seats, the primary is the general election, yeah, right? right? right. And so we have these dynamics in these safe Republican seats, and if and if a woman cannot be competitive in the primary for a variety of different reasons, again, I don't you know I don't like to make stereotypes, but the stories that we've heard from others are you know a typical sort of experience with donors, uh, where you know the donor will write a check to the guy with no questions asked, yeah. but to the woman you got to go get after you have a PhD and all this stuff before you uh, extract a, a check out of somebody. There's just a you know, I mean, I haven't had that problem, but uh, you know, you use creative ways to extract those. But uh, <laughs> but but we hear a lot from women that they have a hard time raising money because there is the, the double standard, and, or you know, we have mostly men that might be retiring, and they're sort of helping who might be their heir apparent who happens to look like them, and so there really has to be an engagement from and, and, you know the Main Street, there's View Pack, there's others that are really trying to get involved now, like help the women in the primary. We had some amazing female candidates in primaries. Um, last cycle that uh, didn't make it out. And uh, what, what are the things? Well, can you hear me? Yes. One of the things that we do in Orange County, where I come from, is we have a women's organization that we started, and it's called the California Women's Leadership Association, and we're statewide. But we use that organization as a way to get women engaged and get them. Um, running for local office so that we've got a bench of women to pull from uh, to go seek higher office. And we've actually had a tremendous amount of success um, in Orange County, specifically because that's where we started. Uh, we started like over 20 years ago. Uh, but, you know, we have to just really get in and build that bench. So if you know candidates or women that um, are thinking about getting involved, it's a lot easier to get them started at that local level and then they get the experience and then you know we bring them up sort of through the ranks because running for congress your first time out i mean we weren't going to tell you you guys did all three of you run for congress was that your first office no, no we I was neither. In the state legislature. yeah i started i started um, at the city council level so it took me 18 years to get sure, here. Wonder women. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah these two yeah but but they're not it's, that's not, not that's not normal. 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 It's not the first time you've no. heard that. <laughs> and also with the changing demographics of uh, of America, and you hear those statistics, and and uh, Elise uh, alluded to it, the the growing number of Hispanics. We need to do a better job of reaching those minority um, communities and tell them that the Republican Party is their party too. And we're getting better at it, but we're still so scared to go into those neighborhoods and go into those groups and say, you know, work with us and, and spread our message on our messages of, of uh, limited government and lower taxes and more school choice. I mean, that gets to the heart of many minority populations. So we're, we're, we're afraid to go out there and, and solicit those uh, uh, those minority candidates and with the changing demographics, 
we're, we're, we just can't afford to, to miss out that opportunity. Big chunks of the population are being ignored. Uh, Kathleen, you had a question? Hi, um, thank you all so much for your comments. We're all insensitive that it's not Democratic or Republican, but it's about women and our families and our children. And where there's areas where there can be immigration, because I think it's, there's so much fatigue with, with this lack of um, getting things done, but not just that, but really seeing results. Because at the end of the day, you know, you're not always thinking about um, what are the issues Republican or Democrat. So I, I, I can start off with that one because um, I'm the vice chair of the Women's Caucus. Susan Brooks is, well, she's co-chairs and I'm a co-vice chair. So we, we divided up Republican and Democrat to chairs, co-chairs. And then um, uh, Susan asked me to be her vice chair. So, um, but we meet and we talk about, you know, where we can work together. Um, to be honest, um, the fluffy stuff we could, you know, work together on. Um, but if you get really into deep, deep policy where you really want to um, uh, have a significant change, uh, moving the ball forward, it gets a little bit more difficult because ideologically we're, we're not the same. I mean, you could, of course, get co-sponsors for bills and all that kind of stuff, but um, we try uh, to find some common area where we can do some stuff together uh, through that or through that group. Uh, but it is a bit of a challenge, I'd say. Yeah, I would say um, I to bring my military mindset here. I actually want to get things done, and I make decisions based on facts. And you begin with your objective and work backwards from there. So, you know, the last two years that I was here, we've got, we need 60 votes in the Senate and a box in the White House. If you want to get anything done that isn't just a Don Quixote kind of mission, you have got to find where the Venn diagrams overlap and do incremental things as opposed to. Uh, messaging bills, which I mean, I, we have to navigate in there, but that's just not what I focus on. So I, I look more at consensus legislation. I mean, I was able to get nine bills passed through the House and two in the law, but all my bills were suspension bills. It's not, it's not the replacement for Obamacare, but it's where can we find common ground on uh, things related to veteran support. My two sign in the law was allowing World War II female pilots to be buried in Arlington. I mean, that, I was that was an amazing achievement. Was fast tracking veterans for jobs at our ports of entry. So, I mean, I just look for what's doable. Um, I'm often, I mean, I don't necessarily look for women on the other side, except like on the WASP bill we did because uh, it was important. Um, I'll joke for a second. So, we heard about this story about the WASPs. Uh, like, it popped in the news. My team forwarded to me. Uh, by the time we flew in, like, we were starting to work on legislation. Uh, I was infuriated that he even took legislation, but I saw Carlos. Carmelo had noticed it and he had already submitted to Ledge Council like he wanted to, you know, address the issue because he cared a lot about it. And I saw him on the floor and I was like, hey, Carlos, do you have wings and ovaries? Because if you don't, <laughs> and he was like, all right, you got it. You know? so, uh, I'm like, look, it's important I'm doing this. But I mean, I, I've worked with Tulsi Gabbard, uh, who's the only female vet now on the Democrat side uh, on a few issues that are related to, you know, veterans. But I, I tend to look for all the bills I've introduced, even on once I've had a mental health reform, I look to get Democrats on the bill before I drop it because it's not just messaging to me, it's actually solving problems. And for me, you know, it, it really has a lot to do with the makeup of your district. My district is is a bipartisan, nonpartisan district, so that's how I conduct myself. It's perfect. I feel like I'm a perfect fit for the district because that's where I am as well. But but as we had pointed out, most members are in districts that are so overwhelmingly Republican. They don't even think that way about working in a bipartisan manner. And it just, it, it's not important to them. It's not an issue. And uh, it wouldn't matter to them one way or the other. But most of us, because of our nature, whatever, we're just consensus builders. And, nice. and uh, we are way nicer. <laughs> Yeah, I think I agree with everything that's been said about the process. I mean, the best people to look to across the aisle are on your committees because you get to understand what their issue areas of interest are. Uh, but just to kind of brag a little bit more on the process Mark that went through for the WASPs issue, um, that was not an easy issue. Even though it passed with overwhelming support on the House floor, I remember the barriers that were being placed in front of you particularly the acting secretary of the Army at the time. I, I distinctly remember one committee hearing where Martha had made a request um, for specific answers as to why this could just be taken care of administratively and there was more excuses. 
And I want to say, I'm going to light up, I let you up at this committee hearing if you don't give me better answers. So I think women are much more results oriented. Oh, See how much she at least gave her. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I sit next to Martha on that committee, so she is very results oriented. If I need to disavow, I will. <laughs> <laughs> the point that the majority of women uh, that we work with in our caucus are very focused on results, very focused on getting things done and getting legislation across the finish line. That's why with Pell, when I reintroduced Pell, we had way more co-sponsors, both Democrats and Republicans, because of the success last year in building the groundwork and having those conversations. We want to thank all of you for coming. Yay! Yay. Thank you. Thank you yeah, meeting meeting out this, here. you get the participation award. Yeah. 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 Sure. And you'll be coming to a city where probably some of you have family. We'd love to have you send them um, to come to the Women of Women Tour. We should get roadie t-shirts. We should get roadie t-shirts. Yeah. <laughs>